show today, Karen and Joe Sutton, Joe Howe. So these guys are the founder of a system called Penny Drops, and they discovered the four money mindset. This is something we're going to talk about. Um, so on the show, we mostly have embodiment teachers, but I want a kind of personal mission really to help embodiment teachers get their shit together around money and business. Uh, most of us are horrible at it. I was and have sort of at least become mediocre now. And I realized there's just a huge amount that we as a community can learn. Um, that's why we've had people like, you know, George Cow and Ted Hargraves, from Marketing for Hippies on. <clears throat> it's also, they're more like the external side of things, you know, marketing and different ethical marketing techniques. But I've realized there's an internal side of things too. And these guys have come highly recommended to me. We've had, we've had a chat once. And I like what I've heard. So we've got them on the show. So guys, welcome. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Nice to hear a little bit about your story. So sort of in brief, how did you become interested? Normally I say in the body, but I'm going to say in money for you guys. I'll tell you, it is an interesting thing. All my life for me, I've been completely obsessed with what makes some people have loads of money and what makes a whole load of the rest of us have very, very little. And I think a lot of that came from my background, Mark. Um, my dad came from one of the richest families in Ireland. Oh. And I'm not talking like a Mac mansion and a few nice cars. I'm talking my cousin is regularly in the rich list. Properly rich family. And my mum came from an absolutely dirt poor family in County Limerick. Wow. Her father was a wood turner and she married my dad for money, essentially. And what was fascinating as I was growing up, I saw that there was such a difference in how the rich bunch and the poor bunch handled money. Yeah. And financial catastrophe befell both with all sorts of regularity. And the rich guys always came out on top. Yeah, they, they just seemed yeah. to knew, they knew what to do. They took risks, they nearly lost their houses, they did all kinds of things happened. And they always came out, they bounced back. They absolutely knew what to do. The poor side of the family had money come in you know, bits of inheritances, bits of windfalls, all sorts of things happened. And they always ended up dirt poor. Uh -huh. And I started to see, then when I was about seven or eight, my dad's business collapsed. And we had to leave our home. And I think, to be honest, I was really traumatised by that. Uh -huh. But I started to see how somebody from one background weathered it and somebody else would just go to pieces. Mm -hmm. And it... it just drove me all my life to understand it. Um, it drove my career. I went into, I'm a trainer by trade. Um, but my obsession was like, what makes people really good at something and what makes people really shit at something? And my master's degree is in um, competencies and capability frameworks. So I would go into like the International Stock Exchange or I did an awful lot of work with the legal services and the legal profession. That what makes somebody, what are the capabilities and competencies that make somebody a really top lawyer, an average lawyer, or a really, really bottom performing? And we've applied that to money. What makes somebody way above averagely financially successful? What makes them averagely financially successful and below? And Joe, hmm. your background is very similar. There was a lot of similarities, isn't there? Oh, that's right. Yeah, my parents came to this country 60 years ago and settled in one of the poorest wards in the country in Derby and they actually started a small little business so from scratch the ground up without any qualifications or money or to be honest with you many resources they actually started a business so I was born into a business family I've only ever worked in making my and had earned my income from growing businesses and what happened in 2004, Karen and I got together already and we decided, right, we're going to start from scratch. So we started from scratch with where we were, because I've had two older children in Derby, and started from scratch building businesses again. That, that's nothing to do with a family business, but just from zero, ground zero. And we built a total of three businesses and we became financially free in 2012. And this is the business, this is the training business that we're, we're speaking about. Does that here. mean, sorry, financially free? What would um, you that? Financially yeah. free is, is an interesting thing for us because we're not flashy people or, you know, drive around in massive cars or anything. But if we stopped working this minute, we can still pay the school fees. 
we can still live in our nice house and we can still have a very nice life. Um, mean you're not dependent upon future earnings to in any way in want. any way our assets would support would see us out nicely uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. okay great so so what made you start the sort of money mindset stuff i mean what was there a particular moment you said you don't yeah. need to do it financially what made you go okay we want to actually work on this but to help other people do you know, I, and again, we didn't actually set out to discover the four money mindsets. What happened was back in 2008, after the financial crash, um, I had said to Joe, look, because we were getting a little bit of money through in the businesses by then, and I had a little bit of space to pursue some other interests. I said, right, I want to become a debt advisor. And this was driven unconsciously by my own trauma from what happened when I was a kid and my dad's business collapsed. And I had some sort of misguided idea that I could go out there and help people, particularly other kids, not suffer what I had as a kid. And I went off, did my training, and I was working in Derby in 2008, 2009 as a debt counsellor. In I'd go to people's houses, get all the stuff together, get all the shit together and find out, right, this is how much debt you're in. We contact the people you owe money to, we negotiate, we sort you out and everything is fine. And I must be a bit slow in a way because what I was noticing was that they were in debt and the rest of their family would be in debt. And then they'd ask me to help their cousins and their nephews and the whole lot of them were in debt. And then I think the, the, the kind of crux of it came was, I was called to this house in Derby they said, um, in Little Over, and there was an old man and an old lady. And they were crying when I got to the house because very often people who are in debt, the people they owe money to come to the house and do things and intimidate them. So the pair of them were crying in the house and I went in and I was absolutely delighted with myself when I'd sorted out. A well-known bank had actually lent them 12 grand and was hassling them and all sorts of things. Anyway, I'd sorted that out. And six months later, the guy phoned me up and he said, look, I'm back in debt again. Right. And I, I nearly, you should have heard the swearing. Luckily, I didn't swear like that down the phone at him. But I was effing and blinding like only a mad cork woman can around the house. And then it dawned on me that this is my baggage. This was how this guy did his money. This, you know, he didn't actually understand how to do his money any yeah. Yeah, so you'd sort of put a sticking plaster on top of it, but the actual, let, let me kind I of- I believe it back. works, I think, yeah. <clears throat> that makes sense. And I, you know, you do see these kind of patterns. People listen to this, they might say, hey, people are rich and poor either because of luck, because of uh, oppression, you know, a sort of Marxist yeah. might say, hey, you know, the rich are rich, you know, because you know, they, uh, they, not because they have a different mindset, but because they have power, they have certain opportunities, education. And then other people would say, well, it's just some people are talented and some people aren't and combined with a bit of luck, that's how it all balances out. So, you know, what would you say to anyone that sort of pushes back against the sort of, the sort of psychological side of this? You know, I wouldn't for a nanosecond decry that some people have it a lot easier than others to start with or anything like that. But what you do see in the mindsets and, and is when somebody is in a space where they understand on an embodied level that they are responsible for their own financial success and somebody else not for any other reason and this is how they've grown up and this is what they've absorbed yeah. around them truly believes that somebody else or something else is responsible for their financial success yeah. The outcomes are hugely different right. and there's a difference between responsibility and blame because it is no one's fault if they're in a terrible financial position but when you find yourself in any kind of a financial position or any position really when you understand it's your responsibility to do something about it yeah the outcome is completely different yeah this is what i say to my students who are around embodiment and around trauma i say listen you're not to blame you're yeah. in a bad mood but you yeah. are responsible if you want to take responsibility you can change your mood you know you're you're yeah. not blamed for your trauma and if you want to take responsibility for it there are things you can do about it and that is quite a big shift and without that shift people are in the victim mode 
where it's very it's very difficult to get ahead on anything whether it be money or embodiment or anything else because uh, like they're being done to by the world That's so right. so while we're not victim blaming there is this frame of responsibility here right of saying okay i'm gonna unearth some of my patterns around money which are deep embodied cultural patterns like some of the things yeah. we talked about this a little bit before like i come from an irish family there's certain things there and joe's from a, a sikh family and there's a different you know thing set of yeah. things there Yes. So what do you think are some of the most common patterns that you see then? The interesting patterns that we see is that when we went out to look at the money mindsets, there are the four money mindsets. So there's a mindset to be in debt for sure. But when we researched it, there's a mindset to break even. And it, it does what it says on the tin. Somebody with that money mindset will break even. A comfortable money mindset or saving money mindset is a very specific mindset where people save money and then they spend. And a rich money mindset is hugely different again. Um, and what is an interesting thing is some cultures do seem to have, and I don't want to say something broad brush or, you know what I mean, too much or anything like that, but... Certain cultures really do understand that they are responsible for their financial success. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So when I see my mother-in-law coming from Northern India, not only like Joe says, she didn't um, have, you know, money or, or, or anything. She didn't even speak the language. Um, but she had, and her husband had this huge concept of no one is coming in to rescue me. So I've got to be responsible for making this successful. Do you know what I mean? So you see in some immigrant cultures, cultural patterns, cultural yeah. patterns, yeah. And you see that in, I've seen a difference in different kinds of immigrant, like Irish immigrant family I'm from, yeah. you know, American Irish immigrants. It can be different from people that stayed, you know, back in the old country, as it were. It can, yeah. it's definitely cultural differences I've seen in Russia and Israel and places I've yeah. worked quite extensively. And some places it seems like there is more of a push towards it. A self responsibility towards it. Some places more of a scarcity mindset. Yeah. Like yeah. in Russia, there's often this feeling like it's not enough money, That's you know. Right. And then even when people are quite rich, they can have that as a mindset that seems to be completely independent from how much money they actually have in the bank. Yeah. It's, so we're not talking about poor people saying there's not enough money because it's like okay, you can say well, that person's just poor. They're realistic. But mm. when it's when it's someone who's rich and has that mindset, I go well, something's up here. You know, you're a millionaire exactly. and you still you won't buy your friend a coffee. Yeah. Come on, you know, like what's going on? Something, something's up there. Do you know what I mean? That's right. That's right. And you, you even see the thing I remember. And again, I don't want to get sued for political incorrectness or anything. But you know, uh, the, if you went to Holland, like for argument's sake, um, and you see the difference between people from the north and the south of Holland, and that's a very Protestant Catholic thing, where uh, you'd go yeah. to the Catholic south and they'd give you the coat off their back, and. Like I remember, like, and you know, it's, well, we'll say it's not quite like that. That you know, that they're, care, <laughs> that they're careful. Like, Listen, all I'll <laughs> say is the last two times I've used Dutch suppliers, it's come in at more. Ex both times it came in more expensive than was agreed originally. That's all I'm saying. You're out there. <laughs> <laughs> so but, you know, uh, and then, then I know one Dutch lady. Um, oh my God, and she's the most generous, fabulous person. Do you know? Sure, there are there are patterns, and we shouldn't yeah. generalise totally. Yeah. But yeah. it would be unrealistic yeah. to say there aren't patterns amongst certain groups. Or as a Chinese comedian, I was listening to the other day saying that in China, ha the, instead of saying Happy New Year, the phrase in Chinese in Mandarin Cantonese is "I hope you get rich," and yeah. that's their go-to yeah. phrase for Happy New yeah. Year. So I mean, that says something, doesn't it? You know? Yeah, and they have the Chinese people have the most fabulous, comfortable, and rich money mindsets. And when we did our research for these mindsets, we spoke to lots of, yeah, it was Chinese people, Indian people, you know, those people who actually, from yeah. nothing, yeah. What, how do people change their mindset? So I've sort of struggled, I've I kind of, I've identified some of this, like listeners may sort of be putting themselves somewhere on there. You know, I, I feel like I go backwards and forwards some days. I'm investing other days i'm just trying to survive you know like what do we do about the money mindsets if we're and, and this is what we've been working on for years hence actually identifying the mindsets the first thing is is to know which mindset you're actually in because uh -huh. these play out habitually and subconsciously 
you make decisions you every single day on on money uh, on what's a good financial decision you know uh, so what we need to do is identify what it is and how we do that is we help people by well they come to us often with what would you say the top three problems to change it and that if you want to change your money mindset um yeah they come to us it's really helping people even identify what the problem is the top three problems people come to us with is they say um i haven't got enough money and we're saying to them okay so you haven't got enough money one of you tried and they'll often say things like because our our clients are all small business people and we deem very mainstream small business people um and they say that they chase sales or they're um, you know, maybe borrowing or trying to get other money in like that. They also say one of their problems is a constant cycle of worry mm -hmm. or even this kind of groundhog day that they're always in the same place financially. And that's the mindset at work. What's interesting about how we actually help them shift it is that initially when we were helping people we would help them with all the technical knowledge and understanding so we would say okay you need these amount of accounts you need to put this much in here every month this is what you need to understand about assets you know all the technical knowledge and understanding and within two months or three months they'd fall off the wagon and it would and go it's back. not enough is it the same with marketing yeah. people can learn great marketing skills but embodiment wise, if they're not able to embody generosity and being yeah. seen and being yeah. playful and all this listening and all the things that are needed for marketing, they still can't do it. It's just, they've got a load of books telling them what they can't do, you know, exactly. they don't help. Yeah, it's absolutely right. And the more we went into this, um, we started to get into the world of embodiment and I've trained um, as a trauma therapist. I'm in my final year of advanced trauma therapy training and Joe does a lot of embodiment work as well. And I've not done it to practice as a therapist, even though I do have some therapy clients. But we did it because we start to see the mindset is so deep. In a way, I think this, the, one, the, word, the phrase mindset is bandied about, and it's probably not even that helpful. 